horror that we have a lot that when we found out that we have a lot of exotic plants in our garden as well as non-native plants. And this interest was gener generated further when, um, and, um, by the way, Kathy and I both together developed this talk. Um, the, our interest was generated even more so when um, we had a, 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 we got together for a book discussion with our, within our master gardener group. And the book we studied, which was, which was um, published in 2009 is called Nature's Best Hope. And the author is Doug Tallamy. And Doug is um, a promoter of native plants in a, in a big way. And most people who are interested in gardening have heard his name. And these I've listed some of his books here at the bottom of the page. But I wanted to tell you, too, that he's written a lot of scientific papers as well. So what he's talking about is stuff that he's actually studied in the field. And he's gathered an awful lot of interesting information. His newest book, which has just come out, is called The Nature of Oaks. And that's his favorite plant. And if you're interested in his writing, I really highly recommend the book. It's just as delightful as his others are. Doug is an entomologist and professor and head of the Department of Entomology at the um, University of Delaware. And his primary research goal is to better understand the way many insects interact with plants and how such interactions determine the diversity of animal communities. And he is, well, I guess you could describe him as a visionary. And I'll tell you something about the projects that he's promoted throughout the country. Maybe it'll even go further. I'm going to give you a few definitions to start with. And um, I will also um, tell you what I think is sort of the biology behind um, native gardening, well, behind all gardening, so that you can start thinking about how you might want to change what you have in your garden. First of all, I'll, I have a picture here of traditional gardens, which this is a bit exaggerated, but they usually are human focused. And traditional gardens would, would run in the same category as what I used to do in my garden, and I'm hoping that I can change that. And actually developing this talk and talking about it is helping me focus on what I really want to do. But traditional gardens are generally human focused, more about aesthetics than about the animal life around them. They cre often create a static picture that doesn't change from year to year. So you're happy to have these exotic plants that don't change much. They look the same from year to year. They bloom the same. They stay in the same spot, although we sometimes have to work quite hard at it. And the ex exotic plants are the largest percentage of our plants. And they're generally unfriendly to wildlife. I mean, you don't really want to see mice running around or, well, or deer or um, chipmunks, you want it to stay just a nice picture. I, as I said, this is a little bit exaggerated. Native plant gardens, on the other hand, seem to be more environmentally focused. They are dynamic gardens that change from year to year because you have things reseeding, you have some plants dominating over others because this is the natural progression. Native plants in, the, in a native plant garden usually dominate. In fact, Doug Tallamy recommends that you have at least 70% of your plants as native, and um, you're, then you're allowed 30% non-native. But importantly, they interact with the local wildlife. And we're talking not about necessarily groundhogs. We don't really like them. But we do, we would like, most of us would like to attract more birds to the yard. And the insects We'd like to see much more pollination occurring because we'd like to have, can have the beautiful plants continue. And we all know that bees are in trouble. We need the bees for pollination. So we're, we often focus on the bees. And the butterflies, of course, we want because they're so beautiful. Um, I already did tell you about what I'm going to talk about. And I'll just move on. Now, what is here? Here, I'm going to start with definitions. What is a native plant? A native plant is usually described as a plant that's evolved naturally within a particular region prior to European settlement. And so the plants that have been established in here after the European settlement haven't had as long a time to, to interact with the local wildlife 
and to evolve into something that is going to thrive well. Native plants usually thrive very well in their local region and because of the soil, the rainfall, the weather, and so forth. But it, the important point is that they have been here long enough to evolve codependently with local wildlife and soil biota. And this takes really more than 100 years. It takes thousands of years for this evolution to proceed. And um, they also contribute valuable ecosystem services. And I'm going to kind of um, focus on this idea of ecosystem services. Um, when we define a native plant, we should define it according to where it's native. In other words, a plant that's native to Rensselaer County is not going, probably not going to be native to a county in California. So it's important to have that qualifier. Um, here's pictures of two native plants. One is um, Clematis virginicum, and, and this one is all native to Rensselaer County. Um, I grew it in my yard for a couple of years, and last year it bloomed beautifully, and I spent hours and hours looking at all the bees. I actually am not a bee person yet because I don't really know how to differentiate them, and that's something I'm looking forward to doing, maybe this summer. This is another native plant, Hellenium, which is a desirable plant as well. Now, non-native plants are sort of the opposite of the native plants. They've not evolved here in in um, our in a particular region. They're also called exotic or alien or introduced. And they often thrive in local conditions with soil, the soil, rainfall, weather, climate, but they can compete with native plants. And that's the problem with them because they can actually compete to such an extent that they crowd them out. They are unable to contribute to the food web, which I'll talk about in a minute, by passing energy obtained through the photosynthesis up the food chain. They can contribute somewhat, but just not to the same level as the native plants. And so they don't, they don't contribute as many ecosystem services. And in fact, what they do con contribute, it can be invasive and harmful. And that brings me to the idea of invasive plants. We did have a talk on invasive plants in March of this year in our program, Lunch in the Garden, and that is still, um, a, you can obtain it on our um, Rensselaer County Cooperative Extension of Rensselaer a website. It's on YouTube. Here are two invasive plants, the yellow flag iris and the oriental bittersweet, which are um, particularly aggressive. They're non-native, they, but they thrive really well. and some of us gardeners who are aware of it know that they pop up all the time and we have to spend a lot of time pulling them out and getting rid of them. They're unable to contribute to the food web in an in a, in a, um, important way and they have limited ecosystem service, but importantly, their overall effect is negative and sometimes they can even cause harm to human health. Now, here is a nebulous term that I wanna to try to define. It's, called, it's the term ecosystem. It's an ecological community consisting of both living and non-living factors. Um, the physical factors are called abiotic, non-living. The living ones are called biotic. They um, have components of energy use and input that cycle through the system, the ecosystem. But what I want to point out is that ecosystems can be many different things. They can be a large protected forest tract that is pretty pristine. They can also be a small ephemeral pond tucked into the woods somewhere, which is a very small community, but a community that interacts with each other and can um, subsist very well as their own system. But I'd like you to consider your backyard as an ecosystem too. It has components that interact with one another and um, they're, they make up a system that we, that I'm, I'm thinking, I'm trying to think of my backyard as one ecosystem and, and look at it as a whole in that sense. What do ecosystems do for us? Well, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which was published in 2005, was a, was a UN sponsored effort to analyze the impact of human actions on ecosystems and with particular focus on humans. And I'm mentioning this because they identified within this assessment four major categories of services. 
and I'm going to describe those in just a minute. Um, this assessment was published in 2005. Since then, there's there's an inter, intergovernmental panel on climate change called the IPCC, which has published periodic assessments that are carrying on from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. They're um, not as human focused as the Millennium Assessment, but um, they're worth looking at if you are interested and you can find all this information on the internet, of course. The um, result of these surveys is that we have real, we realized that we have degraded more than 60% of the earth. And as a result, the world has entered its sixth mass, mass extinct, extinct, extinction event. Um, I'm just um, citing this particular study, which was very interesting. But the interesting thing about this sixth extinction event is that it's human cause, unlike the previous ones. And, I think that the fact that we have pinpointed it as human cause may be encouragement to think that perhaps we can have some effect on either stopping it or reversing it. Here are the ecosystem services that were established by the Re uh, Millennium Report. And they're divided into four categories, provisioning, which are the services that are um, products of the ecosystem. The cultural services are ones that are non-material, but very important. And those are the ecosystem services that we have focused on when we garden, as I say, traditionally rather than with native plants. And they're important. They're still very important. The supporting services are the ones that are necessary for the, for the production of all the other services. They're just there in the ecosystem. And the regulating services are those that modulate or the supporting services. And those are the ones that we have some control over when we um, change our gardening practices. Um, according to Doug Tallamy in Nature's Best Hope, the um, loss of abundant species in the United States can be, um, can be actually attributed to the land use. And he, has, has a lot to say about the decrease in bird numbers across North America, which has fallen by 2.9 billion since 1970, and insects populations are declining as, as well. So you can see by the land use survey that he has uh, presented is that in the United States, five, only 5% 5 of the land is still pristine. And this would include a lot of the national parks and state parks. 41% is in agriculture. That's a big, that's a huge hunk out of land use, which could be just native undisturbed area. And 54% of land use, when it's, when it's not agriculture, it's going to be taken up by cities, suburbs, malls, roads, airports, and um, golf courses, to name a few. But it also has a few habitat fragments. And this is what Doug, Tell him he focuses on because he thinks that with an effort we can change this proportion of habitat fragments and, and enlarge them. And actually, his his um, main point is that we can make a difference by doing so in our own backyards and in our communities as well. So, um, what is it about plants that um, makes up an ecosystem? And makes up the, the ecosystem that we live in. And that is, the point is that the plants supply the food chain. And um, the source actually of all the energy that powers an animal is due to plants. They are the primary producers of the food chain. And they are also considered the first trophic level, that is the nutrition level or food level that we look at. And they are autotrophs, because they are autotrophs, that is, they make their own food. And they directly or indirectly feed all the consumers. Those are the other levels, the third, second, third, and fourth trophic levels. How do they do this? By photosynthesis. Now, this is your basic um, science that you learned way back in grade school, and you've probably heard about it a lot since. But here's what happens, essentially, and it actually is a combination of a lot of different chemical reactions, but ultimately, this is what happens. Um, carbon dioxide and water and light energy 
are combined with chemical reactions within the plant to produce as the product sugar and oxygen. Oxygen is obviously you need oxygen to breathe and live, and this is where it comes from. You also need sugar or carbohydrates because that takes the energy that is captured by the sun and um, is passed up the food, food chain. So this is, we could consider it captured energy and it's passed on up to support all ter terrestrial animals. We're talking mostly terrestrial at this point because the um, aquatic food chain is slightly different. Now food chain is a linear path through the food through the food web and here this this um, is a diagram of the food chain and somewhat what the web would look like when it interacts you start with the primary producer the plants and they are consumed by um, primary consumers the second trophic level and these are the herbivores the ones that eat plants and finally the um, third level are consist of the primary carnivores that they, they eat the animals that eat the plants and so forth. You've heard all this before, but just think about it for a minute. And I want to point out that um, food web, of course, is the interaction when these cross over to other levels of the troph other trophic levels, you have all sorts of a mess in here. But the food web is what actually occurs. The food chain is just a simplification of it. But the what I'd like to point out is that insects are a very incredibly important part of this food chain. And in fact, E.O. Wilson, a very important naturalist, a biologist, and a um, humanist, really, has done a lot of writing and has sometimes been called the, the new Darwin or the father of biodiversity. And he says, and this statement is quoted quite often that insects are the little things that run the world. And the implication is that humans would last only a few months if insects were to, to disappear from the earth. Who knew? Because <laughs> we mostly think of insects as just annoying or even dangerous, and they do carry diseases and so forth. But actually, most of the insects just contribute to the biomass, the whole animal biomass on earth and they link the primary producers to the consumers. This is because insects eat plants, they're herbivores. They also pollinate 87.5% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. They do actually do produce biological control of weeds, pests, and disease vectors, even though they may be so themselves, they control each other, so there's a balance. And the decline in insects is probably caused by land use change, by especially de deforestation, by climate change, by agriculture taking up so much space within our United States, for instance, by um, introduced species that can wipe them out, by um, lots of pesticides, by um, over fertilization, and um, also by, well, general urbanization. And light pollution is another big one that affects the insects. So it's something, these are all something to consider since we know how important insects are. So the next thing concept I'd like to talk about is how plants and insects interact with one, with one another. There are actually two different ways they can interact, either as antagonists or as mutualists. So let's talk about antagonists first. This would occur, this would mostly be pertinent when insects act as herbivores or when they eat plants. And based on the idea that plants don't want to be eaten, eaten, they'd like to just continue to live and not be eaten by other things. The plants have developed, but this takes time over evolution, thousands of years. But they have developed um, what, what um, are called secondary metabolites, that is chemicals that they produce that are not necessary for them to live and reproduce, but they are necessary for them to live without being fed. And these, these metabolites deter feeding. And the primary example that you are, are all aware of is the monarch butterflies and milkweeds, where um, milkweeds, because they um, don't want to be eaten, have developed what, the, what is called um, bad chemicals called cardiac glycosides, and these will deter feeding. Sometimes these 
other secondary metabolites in other plants. Many plants do this. Um, and that's because, um, because uh, they, they want to exist as well they, as they can. And so the milkweed has produced these glycosides to deter feeding, but the monarch butterflies in their, in their case, because they lived alongside milkweed for eons, and because their genetics are continually changing, they were able to develop ability to eat milkweed. And this is important. And we know this is important to have more monarch butterflies. And you know, it's a wonderful um, example of what, what's happening within the ecosystem that the monarch butterflies lay their eggs on milkweed. And when the eggs hatch, they eat the plant in order to devote, to grow. And we know now that plants contain energy and this energy allows them to get larger and larger. And then they produce the large biomass that is necessary. Now, of course, we want the monarch butterflies, but we also know that the caterpillars that are produced from these monarchs are gonna be wonderful food for birds and other animals. But really the birds is what we're focusing on right now because we can conceive of it as part of our backyard ecosystem. So that's one relationship, one as antagonists. The other relationship is the insects act as mutualists to the plants. And the reason for this is that plants actually don't have a lot of locomotion and in order for them to fertilize their eggs from one plant to another, they have to get the pollen from one plant to the ovary of another plant. Now, it, you as gardeners know that plants are different. Some plants produce flowers on, on the same plant. Some produce male and female flowers that are on separate plants. Sometimes they're on the same plant. Some produce um, flowers that, can, that have pollen and, and eggs in the same flower. But often these don't interact. They usually are not able to fertilize one another for, and these, the uh, way that this happens is quite complex, but it does happen. So plants have developed so that they can get pollinated. So, so pollination can continue. They develop floral traits that attract the pollinator, pollinators. These traits are, can be changes in color, how long they flower, the size and shape of the flower, the color, and also they, they can develop uh, pollen morphology and nutrition that's more attractive to the pollinators. So we have two different relationships here, one as antagonists and one, one as mutualists. So when um, I think about planting native plants in my backyard, I think really in terms of, of these two interactions, one is is providing food for um, insects to reproduce with. And the other is providing plants that the insects will pollinate in order to continue this reproduction. Now there's a third component or another component in the food web, and this is the decomposers, and they are um, very vital because they take care of the trash. When um, plants, insects, and animals die, they do have dead material, and this could build up if there isn't some way to break it down. And this is this is what the decomposers do. They they take this dead material and they break it down into smaller objects, smaller complex organic materials or basic elements such as well water and carbon dioxide for one, but nitrogen, phosphorus, and calcium, and many other components that that um, are fed back into the plants as new as that they can use as nutrients in order to um, grow and um, produce and produce photosynthesis and produce food. The major players these decomposers are microscopic or invertebrate organisms and even the fungi. Microscopic are protozoan bacteria that are all throughout our soil. Our soil, our soil teems with them. Invertebrate organ, organisms, which are also in many cases microscopic or small, earthworms, termites, and millipedes, and other even smaller invertebrate organisms, and the fungi which get their nutrients from dead material, that is from wood. They can actually break that down and you've seen that happen certainly. And those are um, very important. So in a, 
I'm going to put these all together for another slide here showing the um, plants growing in the soil and the sun shining down on it so that photosynthesis can take place but the plants have to grow first and they need the soil nutrients that they get from the decomposers down here so we have producers we have the consumers and we have the decomposers all together in this wonderful cycle and um, it's amazing to think about that all going on in your backyard Okay, here's another general term, sort of a nebulous term. You've, you've heard it lots. And I don't know that I can make it more exciting for you, but I'm going to try. Biodiversity is the variety of life on Earth, of all life on Earth, in all its forms and all its interactions. And it's all its forms is important. This is the variety that we actually need. So we can talk about biodiversity on three levels. One is the... Um, is the um, ecosystem diversity. Um, for instance, you can talk about various ecosystems, the foothill area, which is where we kind of live, the mountainous area, the grassland, the um, boreal forest. Um, you can talk about it on another level, that is within the species, all of the species of birds, all of the species of butterflies, all of the species of plants are part of the diversity. You don't want just one tree. You want a variety of them. And you don't want just a variety of them. You want all the subspecies too, because they interact in different ways with each other and they have different ecological services to um, provide. So the diversity within the species is important too. But the one that is most often talked about is the genetic diversity that you find within a single species. That would be a plant or an animal. You want, you want genetic diversity to occur there too. And um, why is that important? Because with an increase in diversity, especially genetic diversity, you, you are able to find resistance. This is Darwin's theory of survival of the fittest. If you have a whole bunch of organisms that are um, within a species and one of them gets knocked off because of some disease that's specific to them, then the other ones will be able to take over within the system. So you, you strike a balance eventually. So it's this flexibility that or plasticity that's important within ecosystems so that we can resist invasions by non-native species. We can resist the effects of climate change because some of our diverse species will be able to overcome it or be able to survive enough to reproduce and fill in the niches. Um, the um, increase in biodiversity in, is a, enables us to store more carbon within our ecosystem. And the resistance to pests and diseases, if you have if you, if all of your elm trees, and this happened actually, if all of your elm trees have one gene and a pest comes in and is able to wipe out the species, there's no other genetic diversity to, to be able to withstand it and grow. So that's, that essentially is what biodiversity is all about and why we keep touting it. Now, I'd like to bring the concept of biodiversity into the concept of plant propagation or plant reproduction. There's two ways that plants reproduce. One is sexually and one is asexually. Asexual propagation is also called vegetative. So sexual propagation is, is, occurs by way of, of seeds. The genetic material from one parent is combined with the ovule of another parent and um, they are shuffled when they when they divide and come together they're shuffled so that the offspring has the same number of genes as the original ones but they have a combination of genes in the offspring and this creates diversity or biodiversity whereas in asexual propagation you use the um, vegetative parts of a plant the stems roots or leaves to regenerate a new plant and this is this is able this is an amazing thing that can happen because the tissue is the meristematic tissue of these plants, which occurs in, in many parts of the plants, are able to divide and af actually differentiate into a whole new plant. And it's a complicated process and it's it's wonderful that it can happen. And this is usually happening through cuttings or layering or dividing a plant in your yard, separating two plants from one another. 
um, it occurs um, more with more detail with grafting and budding. And a very common procedure nowadays is tissue culture, where you can take the um, tissue cultures, the actual cells or a small group of cells, put them in a um, test tube essentially and let them grow out and differentiate. But the point with this vegetative propagation, and it's not necessarily a bad thing, there's lots of good things about that because it enables us to produce new plants or cultivars or hybrids that have features that are um, actually good for the gardener and they, they do well. And um, so this is a positive thing. The negative thing is that um, they are not biodiverse. If you develop a brand new cultivar of Monarda, for instance, and you want to keep it just like it is, then you're going to have to propagate it vegetatively and you're not going to have much change in the genetic makeup of it. So for the reasons that biodiversity are good, you would think that that would not be something you might want, but it's all a matter of your opinion and your choices. Um, this is just an old fashioned type of schematic to show uh, vegetative versus seed propagation. So we're assuming that we have two parents, parent one and parent two, this would be a male plant and this would be a female. And you know, that doesn't always happen, but just conceive of it that way. The genome is represented by these capital and small case letters because you know genes come in pairs so they they can be different from one another or they can be somewhat similar so we have two different genomes that come together the pollen and the ovule of the plant and through many divisions meiosis being one of them they generate a seed that contains a genome that's a mixture of the parents so you can see that these two are completely separate from that. So the seedling then um, is produced, the seed is produced, the seedling germinates and grows into a plant that's completely different from the two parents. And the result of this is what we call biodiversity. These are diverse, these have diverted away from what the parents are and it's a completely new genome. With vegetative propagation, you could take parent two and propagate it by root cuttings, for instance, and the genome of that plant is gonna be exactly the same as the parent. And so the result of vegetative propagation is clone, clonal growth. And if you put a lot of these clones together in a um, garden, for instance, you'll have a monoculture. And, and that's actually what you have with your lawns, where if you have a beautiful green layer of lawn, made of all the same kind of grass seed, you've got a beautiful monoculture going here. Um, monocultures actually have problems. They can displace naturally occurring species and upset the ecosystem. They provide over cultivated strains of plants which are less resistant to unforeseen diseases and environmental change. They actually encourage more disease because they, they don't have the variety to fight it and um, they can also increase soil erosion. And so the bottom line is that they're less diverse. And one of the major monocultures in our country are our lawns. It is estimated that there are about 40 million acres of lawn in the US. It's the single largest crop in the US that's irrigated and um, this 40 million acres is actually a combination of lawns in residential, commercial, institutional parks, athletic fields, and golf courses. So, um, so it's it's not just your backyards, but it, it your backyards do make it up. So one could think of a yard as as um, barren as this one that's all lawn with a few ornamental shrubs here and there and it doesn't provide too many ecological services for sure. Why? So Doug Tallamy and many of the, many of the na native plant activists are encouraging people to shrink their lawns. And in fact, Doug Tallamy's um, major result of outcome of the book that we were just reading was a, um, a uh, project called called Home National, Homegrown National Park, where he says that if you take 
all this 40 million acres of lawn in the U.S. and cut it in half. In other words, get rid of 20 million acres of lawn and turn it into native plant plantings, then um, we will really have shrink, shrink in the, shrunk the lawn. Why, why, is not, why is the lawn not good? Well, it's a monoculture, but the grass species are non-native. If they don't retain water very well because the root systems are shallow, they're open to pests, they're very costly to maintain, they don't store carbon well, as well as dense native plantings do. They Mowing them causes noise and air pollution. Um, we have to fertilize them to keep them green, and we often over-fertilize them, and nitrogen runs off into the water systems. Watering is costly and wasteful, and it does little to support the birds and bees. Um, so from these facts, I want to move on to, well, how do you go about starting to plant native plants so that you can have more diversity in your landscape and um, reap the benefits of all these new ecological services? So here's one way that we can start, and we're trying to simplify it for you. Inventory your yard. Go outside, look around in your yard and see what you've got. And not only look at your own immediate yard, but look at the landscapes around you too, because the oak tree, you may not have an oak tree, but all your neighbors do. This could be, be, be providing a lots of ecosystem services to your yard as well, because insects move, birds move. So look around you as well. Uh, if I were inventorying my yard, I would get out a pencil and paper, but everybody doesn't do it that way, whatever way would work for you. Um, identify, try to identify all your native and non-native plants. I was surprised when I started really thinking about it that if I have some woods around me and there's a lot of native plants in there. There's certainly some non-natives too. But then once I started looking and doing some research into it, I finding finding what kind of balance I have in terms of native versus non-native. Of course, some of those non-native plants may be invasive, although some native plants can be rather invasive too. We call those garden thugs sometimes. But you want to identify the invasive plants and, and remove them if you can when the time is appropriate. Um, surely you want to look at your lawn and see how much of it you could get rid of. Do you really need all the lawn you have? Is there a way that you can use it in some other way? You could plant um, maybe a stand of trees there. You don't have to do a whole lot. You could just dig up little holes in your in some parts of your lawn and put a few trees in there. And that way, you don't have to dig up the lawn, which is a which is a very time intensive process. But you could get your trees started, and they take the longest to grow, of course. Um, choose native plants, of course, and um, it's important to avoid pesticides because if we want to encourage the birds and the pollinators, they are killed easily by pesticides. So you want to try to eliminate those. And also you won't need as much fertilizer as you've used in the past and fertilizers even can kill plants. So be, be aware of that. So you've decided to start planting native plants and you don't know too much about them and you're not going to really learn too much from a lot of your native of a lot of your um, local nurseries because in many cases they not only are not selling natives but they don't really know too much about them so i'd say that it's a fun thing to do and start looking at plants and deciding which ones you want and um, learning something about them so it's important when you are choosing plants that you learn about them. There are, four, there are four categories that the plants you have now and the ones you're going to put in later would belong to. One would be strict natives. These are the native species that I, that I um, described for you in the beginning. They've evolved in, the, in this plate in your region, your specific region, over thousands of years. They are called also straight natives. Also acceptable in many cases would be near native species, a species that's not, that's not native to your particular area, but to the Northeast, for instance, not native to Rensselaer County, but it could be native to Maine, or it could be native to um, even Maryland or Pennsylvania. It's fairly near. It's fairly near. 
and um, so those are those are ones to be considered as well. So those would be a second choice. A third choice would be native cultivars. These are cultivated plants that were derived from native plants, and um, they have been selected, simple selections, or maybe hybridized for and selected for a particular ornamental trait. These are also known as nativars. That's another term that's been coined for them. And lastly, would be your non-native plant species. These are introduced okay. alien or exotic, and they're plant which are planted outside of their native range. So how do you know what plants are native? And um, you've got to do the research. And online, there's plenty of material there. First of all, you want to find out where this plant you're interested in is native to. Is it native to your state? Is it native to your ecoregion? Does it produce pollen and nectar that would be per, that would be preferred by the pollinators? Excuse me, I didn't mean to do that. And is it a host plant? That is, is it a, is it a plant that the, for instance, the um, butterflies and moths will choose to lay their eggs on that will eventually eventually hatch and develop on that plant by eating the tissue and growing into a large biomass that will be food for larger animals. Um, also, it's important to choose the right plant for the right spot. In other words, you want to make sure that the site you want to plant has the right amount of sun for that plant. Does it have the right type of drainage or soil? And you can tell that by looking around in um, other areas within your ecoregion, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. So when we look at nativity of plants, where they come from, it's, it's one area, one idea that you can pursue to know what your ecoregion is. Within the United States, there are actually 967 ecoregions. The, they are defined by the um, by the EPA um, on four different levels. Within the continental United States, the EPA has divided the whole country into 12 ecoregions and they've named them. And they've also given them numbers. Um, we are in the Northern Forest level one ecoregion. And I'm looking at, I'm particularly looking at the demo garden, the Master Gardener demo garden in Wineskill, New York at the Parker School on Route 43. So that's where we're talking about here. On level one, it's within the north, northern forest. On level two, which consists of 25 regions within the United States, um, we, we are in the Atlantic Highlands area. On level three, which is in which the United States has been divided into 105 ecoregions, we're in the Northeast Highlands. And on level four, we're in a, the area called the Taconic Foothills. Now you can find out your ecoregion um, by um, sometimes by zip code and sometimes by just going to the EPA website. But I'm just going to tell you something about, just show you where we are. This would be the um, demo garden in Wynetskill is located about right here. This is the Taconic Range. This is the Berkshire. So we're somewhere in, in here between the Hudson Valley and the mountain range. So um, this is approximately where we are. What does this mean? That um, it means that in this particular Taconic foothills, we have a this the geology, landforms, vegetation, and so forth, hydrology is within is alike within various areas of the Taconic foothills. Whereas in other ecoregions, it would have an entirely different footprint in terms of its um, ecology. For some reason, it, I like the idea of knowing where where I am in terms of ecoregion, but you could also just look for where well, for New York State, you could look for um, Eastern New York State. You could look for, if you live in Pennsylvania, you could just go by state too. Um, okay, so supposing you decide that you want to uh, plant, I'm going to use this example that I pointed out in the first slide, um, Clematis virginiana. It's also called virgin bower. It's a clematis that is, produces white flowers in the summertime. And I know it's a native of New York, 
So I'm going to look it up and, and just confirm that it is. I can look at this website in the New York Flora Atlas, and I'm giving you the website here, which you can look later if you um, go back over this talk on YouTube. And it will describe where the plant of your choice is distributed in New York, and it will also describe whether it's native or not. And you can search for it by either scientific or common name. You can also go to the USDA website and the plant database, and it will give you distribution and activity, but it also gives you information by, by um, clicking on it further and further. It will give you county information as well. Um, the Biota of North America bone app is another one that you can use to look up whether a plant you're interested in is native. Go Botany is even another one, but this is only New England. But since we're in, we're so close to Western Massachusetts, I think it pertains to us as well. Um, I want to point out the Audubon Native Plants database because you can search by zip code and find what birds are in your zip code and what plants will act as host plants for the caterpillars that will feed those birds. And then I'm really saving almost the best till last. This is the National Wildlife Federation Native Plant Finder. And this Native Plant Finder was developed in, in by or with Doug Tallamy. And it has, um, excuse me, I'm sorry. This was developed by Doug, with Doug Tallamy, and it you can use a zip code to find what plants are located in your area. So if you're looking for um, um, this Clematis virginiana, you can find out whether it, it's located in your area and whether it hosts it hosts um, Lepidoptera, which are the birds and the and the butterflies. I'm sorry, the butterflies and the moths. Okay, so if you go to the Flora Atlas, I'm just giving you a screenshot here of what it would look like. I'm looking for Clematis virginiana. I typed it in here. I designated a scientific name, and it comes up with a map which shows me where it's located within New York State, and it even goes by county level. Level Here's Rensselaer County here. It will tell you that it's a native plant. Um, also, I, I typed this in Clematis virginiana in the USDA plant database, and I clicked on it, and it shows me that this plant is native throughout the eastern United States. You are able to click and enlarge this map so you can go all the way down to county level in New York if you wish to do. So it did show me that it's in that county, too. Okay, so this is one way where you can find out where a plant is native. And um, I, I think you'll find it interesting to know whether your desired plant is is interest is is um, native or not, where you stand with it. But. What if you can't find that plant? Maybe I decided that I wanted to, um, um, let me just say that I wanted to, uh, I'm gonna just take a picture in here. These are native plants versus their cultivars. Let me just uh, uh, go, go with this one. Monarda fistulosa. And I, I can't find it anywhere. I can't buy it anywhere. I can't find it, but I, but I can find its cultivar called Claire Grace. Is that going to be as valuable as the uh, straight native? And the answer is not always very easy to find. Some studies have been done. They, they aren't totally complete, but just to, so you get an idea of what, what some researchers have done, I'm going to show you a study by Annie White, who is a researcher in Vermont. She um, used this study when she was studying with her PhD. She's currently a lecturer at the University of Vermont and um, did this study while she was working for her doctorate. And her study was called From Nursery to Nature, Evaluating Native Herbaceous Flowering Plants Versus Native Cultivars for Pollinator Habitat Restoration. And her question was, 
well, if I choose a um, cultivar over the straight native, is it going to provide as much food for pollinators? Will it be as worthwhile using as the straight native? And so she grew these, uh, she took 11 straight natives and, and found cultivars for each one and planted them in large fields in Vermont. And she'd studied them over a period of a couple of years. And the, the gist of her study, the way she did it was she walked out into the field and looked at the plants while they were blooming and counted the number of pollinators that were visiting them. That's a long, tedious study, but it actually provides us some useful information. And this is what she found. She took 11 straight natives and cultivars of each of, of them and grew all of them. This is her results, but don't look at the numbers, just look at the colors. And when you see uh, pink, you can see that there was no significant preference by pollinators for these two selections, the Asclepias tuberosa and its cultivar called Hello Yellow. Um, they, they are grouped here according to how the cultivar was derived. In this instance, with this group, the cultivars were selections. In other words, the uh, straight species was grown and there were a whole bunch of these straight natives in a row and they chose the one they chose one that had a color that they wanted or a size or a shape that they wanted or it, they can be also chosen by disease resistance so they're selecting from um, a genetic pool for the characteristic they want and then they cultivate that or clone it as a cultivar so hello yellow um, is is actually a different color from the from the um, straight native. But what happened with the results of her study was that there was no significant difference in visits of pollinators for these plants. So the only the one you can see that the there isn't a great difference in one of the ecological services you're looking for, which is pollination. The same was true for with this Menarda and its cultivar. There wasn't any significant difference between the pollinator visits. And so for this whole set, there weren't any differences except for the Verona castrum, for which there was actually a preference for the cultivar in this case. Now with this, this set of cultivars, these were all hybrids, which vary a little bit more since there were, since there were two different species crossed with one another. So that um, in this case, there were significant differences and preferences for the species rather than for the cultivar. So this is the result of this study. It doesn't help you if you want to, if you find another cultivar of Asclepius other than the hello yellow, you don't know whether there's a difference between that, those two unless that's been tested. So you can look at these tests and um, you can get some results and make, make your decision. Well, actually, if there isn't a difference in pollinator visits, at least I know that there isn't going to be a major difference in that particular service and it will still attract pollinators. So I'm going to plant it in my garden. It may even grow better than the, than the strict native. So that's something that you can gather from that type of research. Um, this is an even better research idea of how research can occur. This was done at Mount Cuba Center in North Carolina, which is a has very large trial gardens in addition to display display gardens and I would love to visit it someday. In this particular trial, they evaluated 75 native echinaceas and their related cultivars. So they had a number of uh, straight species in this study as well as cultivars for echinacea. And this trial took place from 2018 to 2020. And they, unlike most of their earlier trials, they were not only looking at the, um, the way they grow or their horticultural value, but also at ecological value in terms of whether they attract pollinators or not. So there were 75 plants in the study and um, they, they were um, evaluated and they actually put a number to how well the pollinators visited. And that what they did was in this study, they grew them in fields side by side. And during their bloom time, the workers would go out and examine one flower from each batch, from each garden, which each contained a different plant. And they would, they would look at it for one minute and they would count the number of pollinators that visit. 
they would also somewhat identify which pollinators they were, for instance, bees versus butterflies. Um, usually, actually, there were few butterflies that were found. It was mostly bees because they're our greatest number of pollinators. Um, what I like about this presentation is it shows what the color petals were for each one of these species. And it, it delineates them for the best pollination, which would be the top one because it has the most visitors. Um, they, they counted the number of visitors and then they averaged them for um, a year. Or they averaged them over two years and they took the, the yearly average. The um, top pollinator plant was called, was a cultivar actually called Fragrant Angel. And it was slightly better than the than the strict native Echinacea purpurea. And there were, uh, of course, the rest of these are all um, cult, but these, these are all cultivars as well. And you can see that they did fairly well. Um, but what I wanted to point out was that um, these little symbols, leaf symbols, are, are the designation for better than average horticultural value. That is how well they bloom, how well they grow, how um, disease resistant they are, and um, then they evaluate them on, on a, a numerical scale as well. So all of the plants that have of the, of the best pollinator plants also seem to be the best horticulturally as well. We can put this in another graph presented from this study. And um, this is presented in terms of, of most pollination to least pollination. The, um, it also marks the ones that performed very well as garden plants, and there are quite a few there. And the green bars mean that they were single flower plants, and the red bars mean that they were double flowered. And you can see um, dramatically that the double flowered plants aren't as good as pollinator plants. They also don't seem to be as good in terms of their growth characteristics in terms of horticulture. horticulture. Now, getting back to choosing plants. So now we see that we could choose some cultivars that are um, going to be offering the same ecological services that the native, the straight native offers. But we also want to look at um, plants in terms of, we, have, we need to understand the plants also in terms of whether they act as pollinators or host plants. And I want to introduce this term of whether they are generalists or specialists. Generalist uh, pollinators will, will pollinate a variety of flowers. If they're specialists, they only pollinate a few. Now, when we're talking about herbivores, that is insects that eat plants and use them for raising their young, 90% of insect herbivores that use the plants as host plants are diet specialists, which means that they can only lay their eggs and reproduce on a few plants. Um, so 90% of them need specific plants. So if we want to encourage the increase in insect biomass, bring birds and uh, butterflies to our yard, we need to plant the host plants that they will reproduce on. Um, this is not a, a small job. Caterpillar larvae produce the major food for developing birds. And in fact, some studies have been done that show that a um, nest of chickadee eggs, that would be maybe two, three, four eggs within a nest, require six to 9,000 caterpillars to uh, be raised until they hatch until they um, emerge from their nests. So in order to attract birds to your yard, you're needed, you'll need to or provide the host plants that the caterpillars will eat. And if you want to attract a specific bird to your yard, then you need to find the specific host plant that um, will be involved in that process. Now, pollinators um, provide Pollinators are actually mostly generalists. 70% um, of the bees, which are our major pollinators, are generalists. They will, they will go to a number of different flower species. It's never an all or none thing, but we're just talking in, in, in general about general, generalists. Um, we should be planning for the generalists too, but there are some 
um, native bees that will only pollinate on specialist, they, they need special plants. So in order to attract a variety of plant of um, pollinators to your yard, you should plant a variety of different flowers that are going to be attracted to both the specialists and the generous generalists. Also, the other thing I want to point out, which I don't know that I'm going to mention later, is that when you're planting flowers for um, bees and butterflies, one flower probably won't do it. You need to have a mass. So um, it's said that you should plant at least five of a kind in a in a mass so that it it, it produces uh, is in it's able to draw the pollinators in. Okay, so we're talking about plants and um, how we should plant native plants, but it's important to know that not all native plants have the same ecosystem value. Some of them are more attractive than others, and this is particularly true for plants that insects eat. And so um, the, the woody plants that are the most keystone plants that are really necessary, if you don't have keystone plants, your ecosystem will not be um, working up to its full potential. The number, number one woody plant, according to Doug Tallamy, are the native oaks. And this number in parentheses is a number that was de derived from his study. This number is the number of species of butterflies and moths. These are collectively called the Lepidoptera, um, their scientific name. There are 557 different Lepidoptera species that use the oak tree. So if you plant one oak is going to be very busy hosting all of these insects, but it's um, it, it's an encouraging number. Cherries are second in value. Willows are very important, and so are birches. So these are the keystone plants in our area. And uh, there are many different oak species. So if you think that's too big a tree for your yard, you can choose one that's of smaller size, but they're definitely worth planting. Herbaceous plants also act as host plants and these are some of the most important ones and they host less of course than the woody plants of the um as host plants but they um they also are very good pollinator plants so goldenrods the solidago species um genus actually sunflowers from the helianthus and asters from the symphotrichium Symphotrichum genus. Um, we also, as I mentioned earlier, we also need to plant for specialist pollinators so that they have the plants that they need to, um, to um, reproduce. And the important flowers that, that do attract specialist pollinators, and they of course attract the generalists as well, are sunflowers, goldenrods, native willows, asters, and blueberries. How do you find out who the specialist pollinators are and what plants to use for them? Well, you can you can Google it by looking at um, pollinator.org website. Where, and if you put in your zip code, they will produce, they will give you access to a, a fine pub publication that gives you lots of interesting information and, as well as listing flowers that will be good for your particular region. Um, this is an interesting study, recent study by um, Gerald Fowler and Sam Drowage from the, um, which talks about Eastern United States pollen specialist bees and what flowers that they will feed on. So that's the nitty gritty of picking something about, at least gives you a start in picking the native plants that you might want to put in your garden. I'm not, for, I'm not, um, um, approaching this from a horticultural landscape idea that land that part will come come to you another way but um this are these are some of the movements that um encourage the planting of native plants one came out of doug talamy's nature best hope book and it's a concept called homegrown national park and it's a grassroots call to action to restore habitat exactly in our own backyard where we live, where we work, and within our community so that we can decrease the lawn, increase the native, dense native plantings with the goal of 
of um, reducing 20 million acres of lawn to native plantings. And the success has been, can be measured by a map. Excuse me a minute. Can be measured by a map that's um, interactive. And you can sign on to their website and become a member of Homegrown National Park. And all you need to do is to tell them, um, very easy to do, I did it myself, it, tell them to just how many square meters of land you've planted with native plants. And they can put it all together throughout the whole country and see how much of a difference. So it's nice to have a goal and it's nice to be able to measure it as it goes along. So it's a great project, but it's but it's not doesn't require a lot of effort. All you have to do is, is report your own activity. Doesn't cost anything either. And there's a lot of good information on their website, a lot of good information on their website. And in terms of steps to, to go, how to go about it. And um, I think they also offer plant choice examples as well. Pollinator Pathways is another project that's going on. It actually started, I believe, in Connecticut. And it's organized, they, they're trying to bring together volunteers from organizations within your community, within your towns or neighboring towns. And the, the idea is to establish pollinator-friendly habitat that forms corridors. In other words, the butterflies can only, can only fly so long. But if you can, if you have yards that are connecting, that um, the butterflies are, or the bees are able to pass through, then this is called a corridor leading, you know, all the way. They want to leave all the way up the um, east coast. And there's other pathways that have been developed in the Midwest. And these are just um, little um, uh, pinpoints of where these pollinator pathways have been organized. So they. Um, they have a lot of information. They have a lot of community activities. They have plant and seed sales, and they um, um, develop an interest, wide, a community-wide interest in pollinators. And I think these are are becoming more and more active. Again, all of these organizations have signage, and as you develop your native plant garden, you you may want to um, explain to your neighbors why your yard looks a little bit different from theirs. So that, that's where the signs come in. Also, it makes you feel good that you're part of a movement. And the, some of the signs are very attractive. These are some examples of the ones that are, are available. Um, OK, I just wanted to make a little uh, comment about deer, because deer have evolved along with our native plants. They've co-evolved and they are definitely herbivores. But the problem with deer is that the carrying capacity of the land around us has exceeded the number of deers, deer. And so we have too many deer. And I don't know what we're going to do about that, but um, they have produced habitat deg degradation because they've destroyed the undergrowth in a lot of our wooded areas. And um, they seem to mostly like native plants. The deer resistant plants are mostly ornament, ornamentals and invasives. So what do you do about them? Well, I'm, you may hear that native plants won't be disturbed by deer, but that's not true. It, they're just like other plants. So deer eat some and they don't eat others. The best way um, that I know of to protect your plants is by fencing around them, either on a large scale or small, and using um, deer repellents. So um, fencing and repellents, and um, you'll have to put up with it. But just be aware that your plants may be susceptible, so you need to find out about that as well. Part of your research effort when you're, to, when you're trying to determine what plants to grow. Um, a word about your yard. Uh, there are a couple of things to consider in terms of, your, of um, conservation within your own little ecosystem. Um, be careful about, if you have deep window wells, you can capture they, you can capture toads and frogs and other small creatures and they can't get out again. So be aware of that. Um, to protect the moths, consider putting your lights on, on sensors. 
because lights on all night will attract the moths. You've seen that so much, but it sort of freezes them and it keeps them from their activity. And moths are even, I mean, actually their numbers are much larger than butterflies, but they're still the species that utilize um, plants in order to develop their own and produce caterpillars. So we, we need to protect them as much as possible. So try to think about maybe decreasing your outdoor light at least part of the night. Um, you shouldn't mow too low because it will harm the creatures and some of the native plants that might be growing among your grass. So no lower than, than three inches and don't mow in the evening because that disturbs, <laughs> that disturbs the pollinators and the, um, and the um, egg layers. And water is an awful, is a good source. It, it draws in resident and migrating birds. So it will keep your, help keep your bird population high. Now, Kathy and I came up with a couple of ideas for if this information seems overwhelming. If you look around your yard and think, I can't possibly dig it all up and start all over again. But what you could do if you had a, a large expense of lawn is consider adding an oak tree somewhere within that, maybe not too close to the house, but and you know it's going to take many years to grow, but it's a start, planting for the future. Look for native annuals or think native plants that grow early and um, you can you can buy them. They are hard to find though. Start to eliminate invasive plants. If you look, have you identified invasive plants in your yard, you can start the elimination process. I started by pulling a lot of the weeds. When it's time to remove a plant, and if it's overgrown or it dies, then try to replace it with a native and not another ornamental exotic plant. And when you think about adding a new plant, think native. Here are some local sources for native plants. The, um, and these will be, when you, if you review this um, webinar on the YouTube, you can, you will have time to look at the, um, at these uh, different the different lo local sources. I just want to warn you though that some nurseries will label plants as native and they really aren't. So that's where your education comes in handy. The more you know, the better advice you'll have. And I want to just say that I realize this is a new garden paradigm. And, and I want to encourage you to go beyond the um, aesthetic pleasure in your yard and look at what's going on there and appreciate all the ecosystem services that are occurring and the ones that you could maybe provide in the future because you can definitely make a difference. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Betsy. That That is a lot to think about. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, but I just can't no, no, leave no. anything out. <laughs> no, no, I'm not saying that. I'm just, it's, it's yeah, it, that's a huge uh, topic that I was unaware of that it would make such a difference. It's it, great. I don't know if anybody has any questions, they can put them in the chat. Um, and otherwise, I thank you very much. That was great. Well, I hope you all get a chance to go over to the Hidden Garden Tour today too and yes. enjoy what is going on there. Okay, oh, here's a question for you. I want a tree that produces food. Is there a fruit or nut you would recommend as an alternative to oak? I have mulberries already. Well, um, some of the research has shown that the fruit and particularly the fruits of non-native plants doesn't have the same nutritional value as the native and, and they have tested some of them. So um, be aware that, you know, if you want to have food for the birds and the animals for the fall, that's probably better to um, provide it with native plants. However, they don't ne necessarily all produce in the same the same area. It's just to be aware that the eco the ecosystem service provided by fruit in this case may not be equivalent between the native and non-native plants. Um, we have someone says, "Thank you so much. This is so much food for thought and very inspiring." It Thank is. you very much. I have a new lawn that I have to, we just get, we, we just renovated a house and the lawn, there's nothing there. So I can start with. Oh my goodness. You've got a clean slate. I do. <laughs> so, have have fun. Really <laughs> uh, any other questions before we let Betsy go? Doesn't look like it. 
Well, as I said before, this is um, recorded, so we'll put this up on our YouTube channel. You just go to our website and down the right-hand column, you can see the little YouTube uh, icon and click on that, and it'll take you to it. Plus, I will send it out to anybody who um, registered. I'll send the link out directly to them. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Betsy. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Maybe we'll see somebody down at the... the yes. The <laughs> Have a good day. All right, you too.